I am uh, Pastor Hez, one of the elders here, and I want to say welcome to you all. I will be bringing the word this morning, praise God. And uh, I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. We're glad you're here, and what a privilege it is to be those who have been called to lead our homes and our families. Amen, church? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right in. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for you are worthy. You are holy, and you are righteous. I pray that you would illuminate this word as it comes out of my mouth, Lord, that it would directly impact and mold and shape the hearts of your people this morning. We thank you for this time of gathering, and we pray that you will be high and lifted up, honored above all things. Amen. Amen. And so, church, I would like to continue in our summer sermon series where we are focusing on the importance of the gathering, that is church, the, the coming together of God's people, his saints, the church, the ecclesia. And the question we are hoping to answer through this series is, is why is this gathering so important? Pastor BT opened up this series last week by giving us three ways that this gathering benefits us, and I hope I was listening well, so if one of these is off, then don't throw stones at me, okay? I'm sorry, I'm I'm only human. But the first was that gathering helps us to draw near to God. Then he said, it also helps us to hold fast the confession of our hope. And lastly, it helps us to stir up love in each other. Did I get that okay? Amen, church. And so as I meditated on those three things, I realized that within those three things, there was two unifying strands. The first was that he used only the word us, meaning that these things are not something to be done alone. And the second was the fact that these are supernatural works done through natural people, meaning God does something through us and for us that without him we could not do on our own. And church, so that means that when we come together, He is here in our midst, working out the perfecting of his people through his people. And I think that's important, church, because many times we can come into the gathering week after week with no expectation for God's presence or his sanctifying work to be here happening amongst the gathered people. It can just become like routine, like this thing, like going to work or or going home. And so sometimes we can come in not expecting his power to be at work, but just expecting to hear good songs and hear a good preacher. Not talking about myself, I meant BT. (laughs) But if those things that BT pointed out is true, then there has to be something more at work than just the coming and the going of the gathered people. And so I would like to contest that the scriptures show us that there is something supernatural at work during the gathering of the people. And I understand, some might say, well, why is that important, Hez? Why are you making a big deal about it being supernatural, right? 
Many times we like to stay away from that word because it sounds mystical and scary. And so some of you might be saying, why are you making a meal out of recognizing that there is something supernatural happening in the gathering of the people? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, when I recognize that God is at work in the gathering, I come in a little differently. I come in with a different preparation and expectation. When I realize, church, that the central emphasis of the gathering is focused on God and his presence, I just happen to approach it a little differently when his people make him central, recognizing and lifting him up, he demonstrates something that makes gathering significant to the life of a believer. And one of the ways, church, that he operates supernaturally during this gathering is through the proclamation of his word. This is what we sometimes call preaching. And so this morning, I would like to preach on preaching. I would like to show us how God uses the proclamation of his word to draw and sanctify his people through the gathering of the saints. And I'll repeat that again for you because that's my main point and it's kind of long. But I would like to show how God uses the proclamation of his word to draw and sanctify his people through the gathering of the saints. And I would like to do that by looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. And church, this section of scripture starts out rather strange, right? Because Paul is explaining to those who gather in Colossae his role and responsibility as one who has been called to handle the word of God. But he starts in verse 24 by talking about his suffering and his serving. Now, I say it starts out strange because most people, especially if they are passionate about what they do for a living, would not start out by telling you that what they love about their job is that they get to suffer. And not only does he get to suffer, but he says he suffers on the behalf of others. Many of us, church, would start by telling people what we do and how it benefits us. In fact, many of us, church, would rejoice because we have a job that we love and the reason why we love it is because it prevents us and our families from suffering. But Paul, in verse 24, instead explains his suffering, his afflictions, and his toiling, and he says that he is excited to do this for the sake of the gathered people that is the church. And so as I read this church, I began to ask myself, why would Paul do this? Wouldn't it have been more beneficial for Paul to say, I proclaim and teach this awesome word so that it helps people and sometimes it's challenging, but it's cool because of how the people benefit from it. Wouldn't that be a better way to put it? This is how most of us would say it, but Paul instead, he flips it and puts emphasis on the suffering of his job. And he says, this is why I love it and rejoice because of it. And so I just kept asking myself, what is going on in his mind? Why would one begin in this way? And is this important to us understanding why the proclamation of this word is so important to the gathered people? And though Paul doesn't say explicitly why he begins this way, I believe he begins this way, church, because he wants us to know that this ministry is costly. He wants us to know that it is weighty. 
He wants us to know that this costly, weighty job that he has been called to do as one who carries the word will cost him losing his life. But yet, he says, he rejoices because of the privilege of being called one who carries something so significant. And so I believe he begins by letting us know the cost of his job so that we can grasp the importance and significance of what he is called to do. And he says what he is called to do is is costly, not because of anything in him, church, but because of what it is he is called to carry. And he is saying what he is called to carry is so important that he is willing to give his life because of who he is talking about. And though he may suffer, he rejoices in it because it benefits all of those, all of us who gather under the banner of Christ those who are in his body, the church. Paul says we are recipients of his suffering. And so Paul opens up this way in order to pique the ears of his listeners that they might not just listen in casually, but that they would peer in with great intensity, desiring to know more and more about this word, that we would be reminded of it and the cost to those who carried it out for our benefit, church. And so he wants us to recognize that it's something so significant and powerful that he, as well as others, are willing to die for it. They all are willing to carry their cross that this very word might be made known. Why, church? So that we could come in here routinely for an hour and a half and sing songs and hear a word preached? Or is it that we would come in ready, expecting that we would come in postured for worship, seeking the supernatural power of God to be at work? John Piper says it like this, and excuse me, as he gets a little provocative, But he says the plan meeting weekly, uh, the plan to meet weekly, save for teaching but not worship, is like the plan to marry without sex, or eating without taste, or discovery without delight, or miracles without wonder, or gifts without gratefulness, or warning without fear, or repentance without regret, or resolve without zeal, or longings without satisfaction, or seeing without savoring. In other words, if we come in just routinely, just coming to hear songs and teaching, not postured in worship and savoring for God and his presence, if we don't come in expecting and hoping to experience the sanctifying work of God in our lives through his word, John Piper is saying we miss it. He goes on to make a case that not only do we miss it, but he says it is sinful to not desire this. Though some might not go as far to say that it is sin, I think most would agree that at least he gets what Paul wants us to see in the beginning of this passage. He wants us to know the significance and worth of the ministry of the word. And so the question we asked then is what is it that this proclamation, this word helps us to see? How does it help us to draw near to God, hold fast to the confession and love each other by stirring each other up? Well, there are at least three things that I want to point out to you quickly as my time is slowly fading. The first is that the proclamation of God's word helps us to see the mystery of God's plan. 
In other words, preaching instructs us to speak and live in a way that makes God known. This is significant to the church because the understanding of God's plan leads us to live in a new way, church. A way that the Bible tells us is counter-cultural. And so God is wanting to do something in us corporately to his church, through his church, that will put this new unveiled mystery on display. Paul expounds this great mystery in Ephesians 2, the mystery that God wants to make known through his church is found at the beginning of verse 12. And he says that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we hear this church and we celebrate that this mystery has been unveiled. But we must understand that for those that Paul is talking to, the ones he's sending this letter to, this requires them to go against everything they have been taught and have known their whole lives. The majority of the believers in Colossae he is talking to are Jewish believers. They have spent their whole lives believing that God's people is the Jews only and not the Gentiles. But Paul is saying that ever since the beginning of time, God has had a plan to redeem back his people and those who are his, who are his people, is not only the Jews, but he has always had a plan to also bring in the Gentiles. I know many of you are looking at me like, why is this important, Hez? Why is is this part of the mystery important? Well, it's important, church, because this would have been mind-blowing to them unbelievable in a sense. For them to have believed the proclamation of this word would have taken a supernatural work, a work of the Holy Spirit illuminating this word in the hearts of the hearers that they might believe this and live it out. It was so unbelievable and would have been so repudiated to them culturally that to say these things would result in you being killed for proclaiming such a word. Now, how is it that they were able to believe it? Think about it. How ingrained was this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles that people were willing to kill you for saying that they should be together as one people under God? In fact, Paul was one of the most notorious ones known for killing those who would make such a claim. But yet, Now he is willing to die to defend the very thing he was willing to kill others for proclaiming. This church was a supernatural work that to the world is foolishness. And church, this claim is just as foolish for us to make today. This word we preach based on worldly wisdom, is foolishness to man. To think that we get eternal joy and peace through simply believing in a man who walked the earth does not naturally make sense. And to believe that this man was the creator of the heavens and earth is even more preposterous. This is why we must not forsake 
coming together and hear it preached because God chose to work supernaturally through this gathering and the preaching of this word that it would resonate in the hearts and the minds of unbelievers and believers that would make sense of something that the world cannot understand. That those who don't believe might hear, know, and repent and that those who believe might be reminded as culture pulls on us to not believe what we know to be true. That this cultural moment would not lead us to trust in the wisdom of man. I hope I'm making sense, church. Because if I'm not, I got a homeboy with me, and it's the Puritan Williams Perkins, and he says that there are two essential parts to preaching. He says it requires the hiding of human wisdom and the demonstration or manifestation of the Spirit. So I'm not alone in this. I'm not a heretic, and I think my man is all right. Amen, church? All right. And so it requires us letting go of our ways that we have learned through human wisdom, through human ways, and we must allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to do something, uh, to do the power of the word that is a self-sacrificing work in our hearts that causes us to draw near to God through the stirring up of love within each other because church it's when we love each other corporately that the world not only hears this proclamation but then sees evidence of it on display church this is why it hurts my heart to see those in the church quarreling before the world It looks contrary to the proclamation of the word. And it demonstrates a lack or absence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, And I truly believe when you have those who are claiming to be under the banner of the Messiah, those who are claiming to be filled with the Spirit, working against his reconciling work, that he is grieved. And not only is he grieved, but he is furious, church. Therefore, we need the power of the proclamation of the word that God might help us to withstand the pull of culture on us that leads to quarreling. And so that it can work out the sinfulness and selfishness of our hearts. And Paul says that this happens through the realization of God's mysterious plan and the realization of the one who is the key to that plan, who is Christ. And so Jesus Christ is the key component to this word and this new life working in us. And so the preach word, church, also helps us to see who Christ is, what he means, and who he is to the church. Paul says Christ is the unifying key to the mystery of God's plan revealed. It's through him that we are brought near to God as those who were far off, that it is through his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection that we now can understand and know this mysterious plan of God. And Paul says in verse 27, that he takes up residence in his body, the church. He says, Christ in us. This is the key. And it is through the proclamation of the word that we come to know this key. Those during Jesus' time as well as today have had a hard time understanding this very thing. Jesus many times was speaking parables that made these things hard to understand. They would ask him questions like, uh, 
how could one man dwell in another? How could one man be born again? What do you mean, eat your flesh and drink your blood? In John 6, verse 60, it says, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Church, this is why we must understand that the proclamation of the word is a supernatural work. For even Jesus says we can't wrap our carnal minds around him, around who he is and why he comes and even how he dwells in us now. He said those who don't know him can't come to him, can't come to know him unless granted by the Father. This takes a work of the Spirit as he uses the proclamation of the word to accomplish this. Preaching is the main way that God has called us to make him known. And it is not just a one-time event, church, but it's through the constant proclaiming that he works his word in us. For Christ says that he is the word. Therefore, it's through the saints, church, continually coming together to worship, savoring the wonders of hearing about Christ, that he continues to work his word in our hearts through the proclamation of the preacher by way of the Holy Spirit. It's through hearing about him and his life, about his heart, that we can begin to be made like him. It's through his church displaying him and his ways to each other that we are able to see him. Some say the church has to change due to the times. Some say now we're moving into a more digital time where churches must move online. Some say we are moving to a time when we're going to just gather with our families in our home. And I'm not saying, church, that God can't use those things to help you. In fact, we have seen how websites and things online have been helpful. We know that worshiping with our families at home is needed and should be part of our daily lives. But I just am crazy enough to believe, church, that the gathering of the saints is essential. I believe that God demonstrates through his saints and the preaching of his word that he works in us collectively. There is something about coming together that unifies us to move with one mind and heart in unison. Something that happens in the midst of the gathered saints that causes the spirit to be poured out on us as the giver of life. Something, church, that is different from just sitting at home in front of your TV or computer screen, trying to figure out God intellectually on your own. It's something, church, about sitting next to my wife, sitting next to Cindy, 
sitting next to Charlie, next to Joan, Jonathan, Peter, Seth, Nikki, Lynn, David, John, Alex, Sarah, Mark, and the rest of you is something, church, about being in the midst of the gathered saints when the word is coming forth and the church is amening and gazing and excited is something that happens within me that fills me with life. There is a fire that is lit that reminds me that the Christ in me and when it hears the Christ coming proclaimed through the word that it begins to have like a little Christ party inside of me from the inside out and the Christ in me church just begins to dance until the word becomes like fire shut up in my bones and I just got to move and I just got to shout it's something about coming together and hearing this word that encourages us church and if I am honest I don't even know how we could have the audacity to believe that after 2,000 years, after hundreds of pandemics, after all kinds of cultural expressions and changes, that we can think that we know better than God. That our wisdom of polling people and asking their preference of receiving the word is better than what God has prescribed since God has been known to man. That we think because millennials spend more time on social media than face to face, that our ways constitute changing God's ways. Who do we think we are? May we never forsake coming together, gathered to hear the words of our great Savior proclaimed. For it's when he is poured in us collectively that we then lean on each other's encouragement for hope. And so the last point is, I'm getting there, that the proclamation of the word helps God, uh, helps us to hold fast to the hope of glory. It is when Christ is, is uh, when we realize that Christ is the key to this mystery and when we realize that he is in us, that we can hold fast to the hopes of his promises, when we are assured by the evidence and the fruit in your life and the life of those around you that we can trust his promises to be true. And it's when we have that trust and that hope that we can become like Paul, rejoicing and taking this word to the ends of the earth, regardless of what it will cost. That I can know and trust that the promises he has given us in his word is true. His promise of eternity with him in his kingdom. And it's through the preaching that we come to know these things, that we come to know of the brokenness of this world, that we come to know how Christ fixes it all so that we can tell the world then about this fix. Meanwhile, this this proclaimed word encourages us to live out the truths that this word uh, displays through our lives. That is displaying the goodness and character of Jesus. And it's when we see a a community of believers exemplifying and, and displaying that character that it encourages us even to hold fast to his promises. And it becomes cyclical. A circular pattern of sanctification that comes through the gathering of God's people displaying the evidence of his preached word. And then we all like grow. We all grow to be more happy, joyful, and mature. And this is how our hope is assured and kept. This is why James tells us in chapter 1 to not only be hearers but doers of the word. This is why he says in chapter 2 that faith without works is dead 
because the world needs to not only hear but see a community of people together displaying the truths of the word that there may be evidence lived out in a community of people where fruit is just popping up everywhere and that the unbeliever might come into this community and see something that is strange. People all around, different, loving each other and treating each other as if we are all the same people. And this is why it is important to gather that we would not lose hope of this glorious wonder. And so, really quick, two ways that the word practically helps us to do this and to carry this out is that it helps us by warning us. That is, it helps us by reminding us of the dangers of this world and the dangers of sin. It shows us our deceitful hearts and tells us to run to Christ. It it warns us of the dangers of doing life by ourselves, and it warns us of the results of continuing life in sin. But it also helps us by teaching us, by teaching us truth, by contrasting the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. When we learn corporately, we hold each other accountable for the truths that we are taught. We, cre- we correct each other by teaching against heresy. It teaches us how to live, that we would display Christ to a dying world. The body is taught together and holds each other accountable for han- handling the word rightly. And it is through the warning and the teaching that it helps us to mature in Christ. The goal of warning and teaching, church, is maturity. It is through the proclaiming of the word that we are changed. It's through us coming together, joining in the hearing of the word of God together, celebrating Christ together, and and caring for one another that we can be made stronger in him. It's through hearing the preach word and seeing that evidence lived out in the life of the saints that we can grow more confident in the promises of his word. This preach word, church, helps us to grow in the wisdom of God. And we are sanctified and encouraged through the proclamation of this very word. Therefore, we must not forsake coming together centered around this word. We must not think lightly of the gathering for the Holy Spirit is at work in us, using us all to shape us all. And, that, uh, and these things draw us together that we might grow in the faith of God, that it might warn us, teach us, and mature us so that we might die to our sin die to our desires, and so that our main desire would be to look like Christ, that we might become like Christ or Paul or Peter, to where we can rejoice in the suffering on behalf of the body and the gathered saints. May we all get to a place to where we can rejoice in this way. And may we never forsake the power of his proclaimed word amongst the gathered saints of the body of Christ. Let us pray, church.